So we're going through uh, the introductory concepts in this first chapter uh, in our textbook. There's a lot of concepts. A lot of them you've already been exposed to. Some of them are, are new. Uh, one I think we discussed, the continuum assumption. Uh, we use this almost without thinking about it. We think of matter as being continuous, but in reality, if you get a very, very good microscope, you really don't even need a microscope. I mean, it's, it's, you can't do it with a microscope. It's basically going back to the molecule, molecular description of matter and ideal gases and solids. So most of the space is a void where there is no matter and matter is concentrated in molecules. And there's a lot of molecules. True? There's a lot of molecules in a small space, let's say a cubic millimeter, the tip of your pencil or pen. A lot of molecules. Uh, properties. Property is what? It's the way we describe the state of the system. It's uh, mass. It's uh, volume. It's uh, pressure. It's temperature. It's weight. It's density. It's a lot of properties. And what we're going to find using the state principle is that if you can specify some of those properties, you can find the other properties. And so before we get to the state principle, we'll define intensive and extensive properties. So this is just, it's in every thermal book. It seems a little dry. Just try and say, I don't know why this is so important right now, but let me try to understand the concept that's being presented. Intensive properties are those that are not dependent, they're independent of the size or the extent of the system. Extensive properties are those that do depend on the size or the extent of the system. So, mass. Hmm. Think about, here's my system. Let's say I cut it in half. And then I ask, what is that same property concept called mass for a part of that system? Is it the same? Yes or no? No. So mass would be an extensive property, not an intensive property. That's the test to see. Is you cut it in half. Let's do volume. I have volume. I can talk about the initial volume of the system is two meter cubed. I cut it in half. I say, what is now the volume, that new property, or the same property, but for the new part of the system, it's one half of the system, would the volume be two meters cubed? No. It would be one meter cubed, hence that's an extensive property. How about density? I say this two cubic meters is filled with water. The density of water is a, liquid water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. I cut it in half. I say, now, what is the density of the substance in half of the fluid? It's the same. So that's different than mass and volume, which were extensive. So density is an intensive property. Temperature. The whole thing, the two cubic meters of liquid water is all at 60 degrees C. It starts at 60 degrees C. I cut it in half. I say, now, what's the temperature? of half of it. Is it 30 degrees C or 60 degrees C? 60. So is it an in temperature an intensive or extensive property? Intensive. The weight. So we say, okay, it uh, is around, um, if it's 1,000 kilograms, you have two cubic meters, you have a, a mass of, what, 2,000 kilograms, what is the weight roughly of 2,000 kilograms in newtons or kilonewtons? Do you know? Isn't it around 20 kilonewton? Roughly. Okay. So uh, cut it in half. 20 kilonewtons. Is it 10 kilonewtons for the half or not? So weight is extensive. Pressure. It's all at, I don't know, 100 kilopascal. The pressure is 100 kilopascal inside. You cut it in half. What's the pressure on the half? Same. So pressure is intensive. Okay. Let's move on. 
So we talk about the state of the system, and we're very much interested in fixing the state so that if I know something like uh, some pressure and volume that maybe I can go and evaluate from some tables and other relationships, analytic relationships, some other properties, let's say the temperature, the density, the mass, the, the weight, whatever properties, internal energy. And then we're going to talk about this is going to be a hard part of the game is we'll talk about how a process may change the system from initial to final state and then we want to calculate new properties for the state the final state um, so it's important a lot of times we talk about systems that are in equilibrium thermal equilibrium mechanical equilibrium phase equilibrium and chemical equilibrium these currently are not that important. These two are pretty intuitive. So mechanical equilibrium, so if I have a balance of forces, that's like statics, right? Balance of forces. How about thermal equilibrium? Well, if I, don't, if I have an imbalance in force, I will have motion. If I have an imbalance in temperature, I'll have heat transfer. That's not in equilibrium. There's a transfer going on. So for thermal equilibrium, we have the same temperature. Or you could have it so well insulated that, hey, there's no heat transfer, so it's not going to transfer. But think about e a balance in temperature for thermal equilibrium and a balance of force or force per unit area like pressure for mechanical equilibrium. Now we put together processes on property diagrams. So we may start with state one. And we may describe the state one by the value of a property. This would be A at state one and property B at state one. And we could put a dot on that property diagram saying that's where state one is. It's where v, P, A1 and B1 are on this diagram. It could undergo a process. Often we show a process with an arrow it, to a final state two and the property A2 and B2 are there. So what did happen to property A? Did property A increase or decrease during the process? Increased. How about property B? Increase or decrease during the process? Decrease. So the states, this is pretty easy, isn't it? The states are indicated by points on the property diagrams and the process connects the initial and the final state and you could have a process that goes along this path. You could have a process that goes along this path. You could have different processes to go between states. Our favorite is a PV diagram, a pressure volume diagram. It's not the only diagram. It's really the first one we really expose you to for thermodynamics. So what's on the x-axis? Volume. SI unit for volume? meter cubed, meter cubed. Pressure is on the y-axis, SI unit for pressure, pascal, kilopascal, something like that, megapascal, bar, let's say kilopascal, and meter cubed. So if I look at this process, where is state one? It starts at V1 and ends at V2. Uh, talk about that process. How did the volume change? decreased, hence it was a compression, a compression. How about the pressure, P1 to P2? What did the pressure do? Increased. Increased. This is like lining up underneath of it a cylinder with the piston inside the cylinder, okay? And we would put and line up the location of that cylinder such that if the piston is always at the very end, you would have zero volume, but over here at state one, that volume would be this cross-sectional area, kind of looking at it on that end, the area times that length x. Uh, x goes from here to there. See, area sweeping over length gives you a volume, does it not? And so that that lines up. That's why we would line up the location of that piston 
for the initial state right there. And then if you compress it, the piston ends up at state two, right underneath, lining up X2, like X1, the product of X1 times A is V1, and the product of X2 times A is V2. And that's how we would say, oh, this is how you're taking a trapped amount of gas and you're compressing it. <laughs> the pressure is going to go up. You know, it'll work well for an ideal gas, something that's compressible. Don't put a liquid in there and try it. Liquids are incompressible, approximately incompressible. You could still compress a liquid, but very, very little. Water doesn't like to be compressed. The pressure will go up, but the density won't change. We can interpret processes. Let's just take a look at this one right here. There's the PV diagram. Tell me a little bit about how the volume changes. It's decreasing. Okay, we would call that uh, compression or expansion? Compression. All right, tell me about how the pressure changes. So it's constant pressure, compression. You think, well, that's kind of ridiculous. How can you ever have that in practice? Cool it off. Cool it off. Take some heat out. Cool it off while you're compressing. All right, let's take a look at this one. What's going on with the volume? Constant volume. What's happening to the pressure? This would be like having water, and you're boosting the pressure of the water. The water's really not going to um, have a change in the volume, but the pressure can go way up. It, so that's kind of like uh, pressurizing water. Okay. How about this one? What's happening to the volume? Increasing. So is that a compression or expansion? It's expansion. What's happening to the pressure? Decreasing. Decreasing. That makes sense. If you're going to expand an ideal gas or gas, the pressure is going to come down. Yeah. Okay. We've, they've shown it as a linear relationship. Could have shown it as something that's kind of concave downward or concave upward. Either one. I mean, there's what, different ways to make that work. Uh, but here, they're showing it as a linear relationship. This fairly straight as best as I could make the illustration. Somebody says, what happens if you move that piston really, really fast? Well, then what you can get is like a wave and a build up a higher pressure on the face of that piston versus a distance at the other end of that cylinder. There could be a difference in the pressure because you're moving it so fast those cases are extremely rare and if you have that case then you're going to need more sophisticated tools than what we introduce you to in thermodynamics one but in thermo one we look at compression processes expansion processes as a sequence of quasi equilibrium processes meaning it's if i stopped right in the middle guess what it would be in a state of equilibrium if I was going so fast that I stopped, this thing would be kind of bouncing back and forth with pressure waves <laughs> before it came to an equilibrium. So even though you may think that non-quasi-equilibrium processes are very common, they're not. They're very rare. And it's very common for this one. Later, we talk about internal combustion engines. How many people know what type of RPM they ever put on an engine that they may have ridden on a motorcycle. I mean, those, those motorcycle engines really go high RPM, right? Who's ridden a motorcycle, looked at the tack, and can tell me how fast the engine goes? Nobody? Nobody has a motorcycle that rides a motorcycle in this class that has a tachometer and they watch it redline? Woo, don't go up that fast, right? Buy one for you, and you'll check it. You'll, it that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, mm, the department doesn't have the money. <laughs> well, anyway, you can go 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12,000 RPM. It always amazes me. Um, but when that piston's going that fast, it's still a very good approximation that it's always in a state of uh, quasi-equilibrium. Okay? All right. Cycle. What's a cycle? Well... A process takes you from one state to another state, take another process, follow process from one to two, 
go another process from two to three, go from three to four, and yes, four back to one, and guess what you just did? You went in a loop. So the initial state of a cycle and the final state of the cycle after a sequence of processes is the same. You could have three or four processes to constitute a cycle. We usually don't have five, six, seven. It's either typically three or four processes to constitute a cycle. A lot of them are four processes, as the one shown right here. So if I'm going from one to two, what's happening? Expansion, pressure's coming down. Then from two to three, what's happening? Expansion, and the pressure's really dropping. Then from three to four, what's happening? Compression, and the pressure's going up. But then from four to one, I have really rapid rise of pressure with additional compression. It's more compression. So we have some names. Just kind of get used to these names or memorize these names or expose yourself to these names. Some of them, they make sense. If somebody says uh, the, prof the process is isothermal, what's constant? Make a list of all your properties. Pressure, temperature, volume. The specific volume. Uh, we're later going to get other properties like enthalpy and internal energy and entropy, but these are the ones that you already are exposed to on the second day of class. Okay, so isothermal would be the temperature is constant. Isobaric, take a guess. Pressure is constant, and either the name isochoric or isometric would mean volume is constant. So, and then we're going to get isenthalpic, and then we're going to get isentropic, but that's later. But that's later. These words are used to describe constant property processes. Steady state is a concept. What does it mean? Well, it's not changing with respect to time. So if I said, even though I have flow into a control volume, and I have flow out of the control volume, the mass in the control volume could not change with time. It could be a constant such that if I said, okay, is it changing with time? Take the time derivative and see if it's equal to zero. If it's zero, then that mass of the, inside the control volume is constant with time. Same thing, you could have the energy inside the control volume being constant with time. That's the concept of steady state. How do you test steady state? Typically take the time derivative of something of interest and say, is it changing with time? If it's changing with time, it's transient. If it's not changing with time, it's steady state. Guess what? 99% of the problems we solve in Thermal One are steady state. Makes life a lot easier, a lot easier. You can have a very complicated process. You could have cold fluid coming in over here, hot fluid coming in out there. Somebody says, how can that be a steady state process? It can. I could have constant temperature, always cold coming in here, constant temperature, always hot coming out there. And then what I'm doing is I'm adding heat to the system to make that system work. You, you have to think about that for a minute. Oh yeah, that could be a steady state process. Even though if I follow a little chunk of fluid, guess what's happening to the temperature of the chunk of fluid? It's going up. So for the little chunk of fluid that goes through it, but we're not necessarily tracking, oh, that chunk of fluid or that chunk of fluid. Oh, we'll give you a name. Oh, we'll t track Tom now. Oh, no, no. We're not doing that. We're just saying fluid comes in cold, fluid goes out hot, and that could be a, a, a steady state behavior for that system. You could even have work transfer. You could have a paddle wheel in there churning it up. So work transfer, heat transfer, coming in cold, going out hot, and still be a steady state process. State postulate. This is a hard one. This is where students, they don't understand this. It's too abstract, but it's a foundation. I would say the most misunderstood thing that I see in Thermo 1, Thermo 2, late in the semester in Thermo 1, all through Thermo 2, is they don't grasp the state postulate. So what is it? It's not that hard. It says, for the type of systems and fluids that we deal with, 
simple compressible systems, you can completely specify the state of the system by knowing two independent intensive properties. Well, we know what a property is, make our list. Pressure, temperature, volume, mass, specific volume, uh, density, internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, we're going to get to more of them. But uh, we now need to know what is an intensive property. Was pressure intensive? Yes. Temperature intensive? Yes. Volume? No. Mass? No. Specific volume, the ratio is, just like the ratio, the inverse, is is intensive. Those are reciprocal. Density is equal to 1 over the specific volume. The specific volume is 1 over the density. So those are intensive. So at this point, if I knew maybe temp pressure and temperature, or if I knew pressure and specific volume, or I knew temperature and specific volume, and those two properties were independent, we'll get to that in a second, well, they are definitely intensive. Then, from the state principle, for the types of substances we work with, the simple compressible systems, I could go and I could get the missing. So for this case, I could get the specific volume, knowing temperature and pressure. I could get the temperature, knowing pressure and specific volume. I could get the pressure, knowing temperature and specific volume. And then now, when you get more than three properties, you get internal energy, enthalpy, entropy, Gibbs function, Helmholtz. You get a lot of properties. That really pays dividends. Right now, you're kind of yawning. Huh. What is this all about? Say it's important and try to understand it. All right? Tell yourself this is important. I don't understand why, but it's important. Now, some about this independent properties. You can have steam, pure H2O, H2O, we call that steam. It could be superheated, all vapor, hot, high, high temperature, modest pressure, but that's still some pretty high pressure, 4,000 kilopascal. And in that case, temperature and pressure are independent. But you could have H2O, steam, same thing, H2O, steam. And it could be in the two-phase region, meaning that if you had a little container, piston cylinder container, you could look inside that piston cylinder container, you'd see what collected on the bottom was a very dense phase of the substance. And over top of it was a much lighter phase of the substance. What do you think that phase is described as? What do you think that phase is described as? Liquid vapor liquid being dense, vapor being not so dense. And it's in equilibrium. It's in thermal equilibrium and it's in mechanical equilibrium. It, both phases have the same pressure. Both phases have the same temperature. That's what it means to be in mechanical and thermal equilibrium. And guess what? In this case, temperature and pressure are not independent. Just kind of tuck that away. We'll revisit this in chapter three. So sometimes temperature and pressure are, we're very happy to say, independent properties. Sometimes this is the big case right here. In a two-phase substance where you have liquid vapor mixture in equilibrium, then you can have it. They're not independent. If I know temperature, there's only one, one and only one pressure that works for that system. If I know pressure, temperature is not independent. There's only one temperature that works at that pressure. I can't have them both independent for a two-phase. When it's superheated, I can have both of them independent. I could say, leave it at 280, and now let's change the pressure to 5,000 kilopascal or 3,000 kilopascal. Yep, it'll stay superheated vapor, and those two values will work. And I'll probably get a I will get a different value, a specific volume for both of those cases. Okay. Units, very briefly, you've been exposed to units, you've been lectured on units. I'm just going to repeat the lecture on units. There's two great systems of units out there that we use. SI, throughout the world, 
And in the United States, the United States customary system units. You may call it the British system units. The British don't use it anymore. Why would you call it? Historical purposes, great. Call it historically the British system units. The English system units, not all the English world is using these system units, only in America, only in the United States, and Guam, and maybe some other place. But you go to Canada, you go, that's English speaking, they don't use it. You go to England, they don't use it, they're using SI. So it's the customary system of units in the United States. That's the best label for this system of units. Not the English, not the British, not the Imperial, or whatever. Just call it what's used in the United States on the streets. Customary. You talk to a person on the street. Say, do you know how long is a foot? Do you know how hot uh, 70 degrees is, degrees F is? Do you know, you know, something, you know, which is in the language on the street, they'll know it. This one is also nicknamed or called the metric system, SI. Sometimes they'll call it the metric. Sometimes they'll call this the SAE system. So if you buy wrenches, you know, the metric met wrenches or SAE, basically it's in millimeters or fractions of inches, right? So nothing new there. If you start a problem and solve a problem, just think of the Great Wall of China. If you're given the problem in SI units, Stay on that side. Don't convert, solve, and reconvert and express the answer. Don't do that. And if you're given a problem with these system units, stay on that side. Stay all BTUs and inches and foot and PSI, etc. Got it? Think just the best way to do it. If you're given that system, stay in it. All right. Now, why don't we? Uh, why do we even cover? the U.S. customary system units anymore. Why is this even taught? Well, when I was a student like you, guess what? This is old-fashioned going out. Nobody's going to use BTUs and feet anymore. Books ripped it all out, and that's it. There was no problem for a lot of books. It's all SI. But then guess what? The graduates came out the first day on the job. You know, they were just being chewed up. Just think of the old engineer out there, the old technician, 20 years with the company. You just got hired. You're making more money than them. What do you, how do you think that's going to feel? Guess what they're going to do? Try to put you in your place by putting you down a little bit, ask you a tough question, and then tell everybody else that for the rest of the day, this new hire don't even know what a BTU is. It's going to happen to a lot of you if it hadn't happened already. But anyway, so we decided we really need to kind of put this back in textbooks because it ain't gone. It's not gone. It's going to be here for a while. When will it be gone? When will we stop using inch, pounds, feet, miles, gallons, and all that? You can go back historically. People have written papers. You know, the first Continental Congress pa passed a law saying all commerce in the United States in 1700 will be done in metric units. Did it take effect? Jimmy Carter and big push in the 70s. I mean, it's been pushes and pushes and pushes. It'll stop when this really forces it to stop. And in a number of industries, it's already stopped. How many people are automobile mechanics? How many people really need to buy uh, SAE wrenches to work on an automobile made since about 19, I don't know, 90 something? You really don't need it. It's all metric. But if you're working on old cars, it's important to have SAE tools. That's it. That's right. You have to have them if you have old cars. But uh, basically, the automotive industry, they get parts from Mexico. They get parts from China. They get parts from Canada. They get parts. They sell them all over the world. And they're serviced all over the world. So guess what? Automotive industry is all, oh, they'll talk inches, but they really are. It's all. All right, who, uh, Rebar even, a couple years ago, the company that's out by Seguin that sells Rebar. You call them up, you say, I want a half-inch re-rod, re you know, Rebar for reinforcing concrete structures. They'll sell you the half-inch, but everything in their plant's metric. It is. It's, it's all metric. They really are metric already. Um, what other industries are all? Well, anything that really has done a lot of trade, 
with across borders. They have to be metric. It has to be, it's standardized. Which industries are going to be the last to go? HVAC, our buildings and still in square feet and energy consumption is still in CFM for airflow and BTUs and it's going to be a long time for the HVAC industry. It's very sluggish. And also it's interesting is the auto, not the automotive, the aircraft industry. <laughs> Talked to aircraft engineer, uh, technician and uh, he lived in Germany and worked in Germany for a long time <laughs> and speaking you know German very fluent in German and give me the half inch wrench <laughs> so as I understand it the aircraft industry because it's so dominated by the United States for so long is very uh, much still in I could be wrong it changes quickly very much still in what they call SAE yes Oh, really? It's all torques or something even special, more special than that. Yeah. If things do change, and in your lifetime, things will change even faster than they change them. I'm not dead yet, but my lifetime, right? So, uh, yeah, things are, it's going to go. Uh, there's a highway in the United States that's all metric. It's in Arizona, southern Arizona. Why? Because so many people drive from Mexico on the highway. It just made sense to make it all metric when they built it. So all the exits are in metric, all the speeds are in metric, everything's in metric. There's not even the speed and MPH over the KPH. It's not. It's completely metric in the United States, but that's very rare. <laughs> uh, why doesn't Congress pass a law? They've done it. Why doesn't President do initiative? They've done it. It just, it's like trying to pass a law about other things. It's other factors commerce is really going to make that happen and has made it happen so when you have the mks for meter kilogram second that's the one we really use a lot in this class but we'll use the foot pound second inch pound second we really don't use centimeter grams and second that's really kind of the chemist physicist chemist all right fundamental dimensions how many are there Seven, what are they? You could probably list off the number four of them, like length, mass, time, temperature. The amount of a substance, think about kilomoles. Electric current, that seems out of place, ampere. And luminous intensity, don't ask me, more candela. It's some international standard. They got together, they said, you know, we can, these are the fundamental building blocks. We could build all other dimensions out of these. These are our fundamental dimensions and then they can describe a bunch of things like area is length times length. Density is mass over length, length, length. Length per unit time is speed. Force is there you go. Work is there you go. Power is there you go. Make sense? You've seen it before, right? Good. Basic principles that we use again and again and again, the fundamental is conservation of mass, so we have a mass balance, conservation of energy or energy balance, and then the concept that you can't transfer energy between forms willy-nilly. Some transformation of energy between forms is easy, some is hard. Hence, you could think about energy having sort of quality, and there's some very valuable forms of energy that can be transferred into any other form. And then there's some lower quality forms of energy which are harder to transform into a form that maybe we really want. <laughs> so we can't get 100% conversion that way, right? From, from low quality to a high quality form of energy. So energy uh, is always kind of uh, being degraded. That's another concept of the second law. Or there's quality associated with energy and the transformation of energy is limited because of this quality concept. So, uh, mechanical to thermal, easy. You can go to Walmart and buy a device that'll do that. You plug into the wall, get electric energy out, right? And you'll heat the room. Go to Walmart and say, I've got a hot room and I want to make electricity and put it into the grid and sell it back to CPS. I'm tired of paying these high bills. My home is hot. 
hey, Walmart, sell me something that I can plug into the wall. It'll take the hot room, cool it off, because I got to conserve energy, and sell electricity back to CPS. Good luck. That's hard. That's hard. That's where engineers come into play. We burn things to turn things. We make power plants, and that was phenomenal and really the root and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The concept, if you wanted anything done, you had to use animal muscle or human muscle before the Industrial Revolution. With the Industrial Revolution, it was like, what? You're going to lift water up by burning something? Can't be done. Impossible. But that's the, the, the steam engine. And that was the big impetus to the Industrial Revolution. Big impact in our life. Energy, what are the units? Joule, which is a force times a distance, something like SI, Newton, meter, or instead of a joule, often we talk about kilojoules. What's a kilo? Just a thousand. True? Good. BTU, oh man, okay, fine. One pound of water, you're gonna heat it up, it starts at 68, it's gonna increase by one degree F. That's how much heat that is, that's how much energy that is. So maybe you say, I'll just commit that to memory for historical purposes. That's what the definition of a BTU is. You don't use BTUs that much in this class, but you're exposed to it. Concept of mass, all right, what's a kilogram? Who has a water bottle? I see something over there. Is that a half a liter? How big is that? 591 Okay, so it's more like a, uh, what do they call that, a quart? Not a quart. What is it? Anyway, it's more. If you, water bottles are uh, 500 ml, 500 milliliter. That's half a liter. I have a one liter bottle up on my desk. I was going to bring it. I was going to fill it up out here. Then I could take it with the cap on. Not, a show, not encourage you to drink it, but I could throw it to somebody and say, there's a kilo. You could take in your hand and see exactly what a kilogram is. One liter water bottle, pick it up, that's a kilo. There's a lot of people in this room say, uh, what's closer to the weight of a kilo, me or, you know, this? No, I, I have no idea what a kilogram is. I don't know. I have, I have no notion. There's other people in the room, I'd say, what's your weight? And they'd say, uh, 72, 73 kilos. I'm somewhere in there because I, did I eat a big breakfast or did I sweat a lot yesterday? I'm not certain exactly what my weight is. So they're thinking kilos, but a lot of people in this room, no idea. Get a one liter water bottle, pick it up, go like that. That's a kilogram. Okay. What's weight? Weight. Weight, you know, as mass times G. Just tell me what G is. Oh, G is 9.81 meter per second squared. If I wanted to round that off, 10 meters per second squared, isn't it? So it's kind of easy to go, but there's a factor of 10 going from the, uh, the mass to the weight in the, in the SI system of units. Somebody says, no, 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 I don't do that. I do 32.2 foot per second squared. Okay, you're in the United States customary system of units. That's what G is, roughly. Just like 9.81 is, true? So that's the difference between weight and uh, mass. So I had that one liter water bottle. It had one kilogram of mass of water in it. Okay, what is the weight of it in Newton? Let's round off to 10. 10, right? 10? So how many? 10? 10 Newtons. True? So there you go. Put it in perspective. You can buy, pick up one liter bottle of water, and you can play with it, throw it with a friend, whatever. Uh, show your mom, dad, hey, I'm learning something at the university. Did you know this one liter is one kilo? Okay, great. And this has a weight of uh, 10, uh, 10 Newtons. I've asked this question exactly, and I'm sorry, I had to have my computer wiped and re-imaged, and I only got it back yesterday at a certain time, so I'm limping along, and I didn't get my, um, I, I, I can't, I have no clickers, but this was going to be a clicker question. It's ready set up for it. This was on an exam before. You would think, Professor, you've lectured so well. 
You were so clear, crystal clear. Nobody could misunderstand it. This question's easy. What is the mass of water in a 500 milliliter water bottle when it is full? I've gotten this answer. I've gotten this answer. I've gotten all of these answers. What is it? B. That's right. I've even had people that tell me, I said in my office, I said, what's your weight? And they're struggling on the second or third digit. Well, uh, this morning, maybe I ate a big breakfast. Maybe I'm 63 kilos. You're thinking kilos, and yet you answered that that's 5,000 kilograms in a bottle of water that I can pick up with one hand and drink. Don't turn off your brain when you take an exam in engineering. Actually try to turn on your brain. You know, there's a lot of times students will ask questions that kind of reveal something. It's like, well, do you want my honest opinion about what this is all, or do you want me to just tell you what the textbook will say the right answer is? Well, hold it. If there's a wrong answer in the textbook, everybody should know about it. Um, either the textbook's right, and we need to adjust our, our concept, the reality with it, or, or not. Anyway, the student was like embarrassed. Yeah, you're not getting any credit for that an wrong answer. Um, density. So density is the mass per unit volume. True? Sometimes you put a V with that for volume instead of velocity. And the specific volume is 1 over density. So the SI units are kilogram per meter cubed or meter cubed per kilogram. This one you can think about. You say, okay, I have one cubic meter volume. I put my substance in it that has a density, and then I can tell you how many kilograms are in it. Think about this one. You say, well, I pick up one kilogram of the substance, and then the specific volume tells me how much volume it'll take or occupy that one kilogram. That's how you would help interpret uh, specific volume and density. Again, what's the relationship? One over. I already wrote that. What's specific weight? Well, we know what the weight is. That's M times G, true? Specific weight. What would be the specific weight? Yeah, specific often means kind of the uh, per unit mass or per unit volume. This one is, it would be a, a, a rho times a G. A rho times a G is a specific weight, not a specific gravity. Specific gravity in fluids is different. It's comparing it with the density of water at 4 degrees C. Specific gravity is not the same as specific weight. So. What is uh, rho, mass per unit volume, times g? So what would be some sort of SI units? Well, they're newtons per meter cubed? True or false? No, that's true. It would be something like how much weight per unit volume? What about the molar volume? We did the mass density, rho, we did the specific volume, but now you could talk about the molar specific volume or molar volume. Sometimes you put molar specific in here or just molar volume. Well, it's V bar, lowercase v bar. Hold it. What was V again? That was 1 over rho. What was rho again? Uh, mass per unit volume. So V was volume per unit mass, true? Right? Specific volume on a molar basis would be volume per unit amount. Amount, lowercase n, instead of m for mass, m for mass, you have n for amount. And we measure mass in kilograms, we measure amount in kilomole or mole. Usually we use kilomole. I didn't spell amount right. Oh, well. Amount. Okay. So that's what we talk about, molar volume. V bar. What's the bar over there for? In this textbook, the over bar means it's 
amount, not mass. So this V is the same as that V, but there's an overbar. Hence, it's volume per unit amount. The units on this one would be meters cubed per kilomole, where the SI units for the specific volume are meters cubed per kilogram. Make sense? All right. Ideal gas, everybody knows ideal gas equation. P, V is equal to N, R bar T. More of that in chapters two and three, but you have been exposed to it. I see I'm out of time, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Have I encouraged you to read the book? I'm just curious. Somebody told me yesterday, nobody buys textbooks anymore, Professor. You're living in the 1980s. How many people buy textbooks? Somebody else said about 30%. I would say that's about 40% that raised their hands. Interesting. Thank you very much. Have a safe weekend.